If you want supply fast, the private sector is always the group that's going to be able to deliver because that's simply what they do. Capital is what they do. Hello, and welcome to Sink or Swim, a weekly podcast brought to you by RentSync, where we take a deep dive into the prop tech, multifamily, and rental housing industry. In each episode, we uncover the technologies and strategies used to help overcome operational challenges and increase the value of your multifamily investments. So let's get into our conversation today. All right, welcome back to another episode of Sing or Swim, a podcast where we take a deep dive into the prop tech, multifamily, and rental housing industry. Today, we'll be focusing on the latter, the Canadian rental housing industry. We have a bit of a different episode for you today. Joining us is Peter Sean Taylor, Senior Features Editor at the C2C Journal. Peter, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure, Matt. Now, the reason we have brought in Peter today is to discuss one of his most recent articles titled, Marxism Won't Solve Canada's Rental Housing Crisis, Despite What Ottawa Thinks. This piece grabbed the attention of many players in the Canadian rental housing industry. It's no secret that Canada is currently facing a housing crisis. Supply is down with no real relief on the horizon. Some people in Ottawa believe the crisis stems from some other reasons. So we wanted to have Peter on to discuss his article even further and get his insights into the housing crisis we currently face. But before we dive in, Peter, why don't you tell the listeners a bit about yourself and what led you to write this article? Sure. Well, as you said, I'm Senior Features Editor at C2C Journal. That's an online Canadian magazine focused on essay-length pieces on economics, politics, public policy, that sort of stuff. Web address is www.c2c, the letter C, the number two, the letter C, journal.ca. I've been there for about four or five years now. Before that, I've had quite a long career in print journalism. I was at the National Post when it started. I was at McLean's for about 11 years, Canadian Business Magazine. I was a staff writer, written regularly for Globe and Mail and ROB Magazine. So I've been around for a while. It started in 1989. And I have a master's in economics. So I look for stories that sort of marry economics and politics and public policy. And housing does all those things. So it's one of my favorite topics, along with childcare and airports and anything that that brings together economics and politics in that way. So, So I've spent a lot of time on housing. I've written quite a bit about it. And when last summer or so, I got a an email, I guess I'm on some sort of email list from the Federal Housing Advocate, which was a organization I'd never heard of before, but uh, it's a, a federal office. They sent me an email about their investigation into the financialization of the, the housing market. I figured this is something I should probably take a look at. And as I, as I read, I got more and more outraged or shocked or befuddled by what I found, which means you're probably onto a pretty good story. So Something that uh, hasn't been covered very much by the rest of the media, but some of the things going on in Ottawa with respect to housing and and coming out of this federal housing advocate and the National Housing Council, which is another organization that's just recently been set up by the Liberal government. There's a lot there to chew on, and certainly it's of I think it should be of great interest to the purpose-built rental housing industry in Canada. There's uh, some very troubling uh, things there. So that's the medium-length version of how I ended up to write this story. Yeah, there's a lot to chew on and we'll definitely get into it. So for any mm-hmm. listeners who haven't really had a chance to read your piece, you know, we'll, we'll attach it when we put this out for anyone to, to get a chance who haven't. But let's try to set the stage a little bit for any listeners who haven't had a chance yet. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned Canada's Federal Housing Advocates and their office. This is you know, a main character in your, <laughs> uh, in your article. This sure. is a new position created by the Trudeau government. Her name is Marie Jose Huell. Could you just briefly explain what Marie and this office has been tasked with? Sure. This comes out of the Trudeau government's 2019 federal housing strategy. One of the key but perhaps underreported aspects of that strategy is the claim that housing is a human right. This is certainly a novel and somewhat contentious argument. The Liberals passed a bill in which they claimed to abide by the notion that housing is a human right. You need to mention that this is not the same as it actually being mentioned in the Charter of Rights, for instance. It's not. It's really just a statement of policy. Another government could come along and cancel the bill and and this would go away. But be that as it may, Trudeau Liberals are currently operating their housing 
policy with the belief that housing is a human right. And so as part of that, they created this office of the federal housing advocate, Marie-José Uhl, who was appointed uh, almost a year ago, February 2022. And they created a National Housing Council, which is supposed to give advice. And the advocate and this council are supposed to work together in some ways to bring issues up that um, reflect this housing as a basic human right perspective. So the first thing that the federal housing advocate has done, really, of any substance, is commission a whole series of reports and studies on what they call the financialization of housing in Canada. The the quick version is that it's all bad, and the federal housing advocate has asked the National Housing Council to hold an inquiry into this. So attention will be paid to financialization of housing in Canada, which has become the sort of the rallying cry of this political sort of pursuit. So the next question you might ask me is financialization of housing. What does that mean? Exactly (laughs) what I was going to ask you. (laughs) It's a very good question because... It is not entirely clear, other than the fact that all these folks think it's a very bad thing. They don't do a very good job of defining it precisely. Really, it's just a catch-all phrase for anything they don't happen to like about how the housing market works now is evidence of financialization. I can give you, I got the reports here. I can give you a couple of what they claim to be the definition. And when this the summary, this comes from the summary report of the Federal Housing Advocate in a her uh, investigation into financialization. Financialization refers to a shift in the operations of capitalism in which finance capital has come in recent decades to dominate the economy and everyday life. Financialization has also been measured by researchers who have tracked the growing increase in financial transactions, the profitability of financial firms, and the growing share of national incomes taken by holders of financial assets. I could go on. All sorts of different definitions pop up in this work. Generally, it's an animosity towards anyone making profit in the rental housing market. These folks use capitalism as a pejorative. They think making a profit is bad. Making a profit denies people their basic human rights to housing. If housing was cheaper and because people weren't making a profit at it, then more people would be able to fulfill their human destiny to have the sort of housing that they wanted. So, you know, as you read the the title of my piece, uh, the first word was Marxism. This is, and always sound, you always sound a little goofy if you go around claiming your opponents are Marxists, but I think this is one of those cases when it's pretty clear this is their general predisposition. It's not just Ool, the, the federal housing advocate. It, she's assembled a kind of a team of academics across Canada to promote her idea of financialization. There's a whole series of reports, not just one report, a whole series of reports written by academics who all seem to share the same political outlook that capitalism is bad, profit is bad. If we didn't have capitalists, everyone would have a better house and be happier. So that's that's my perspective on what financialization means. If you asked the federal housing advocate uh, her opinion, you might get something different. But that's, from my perspective, generally an animosity towards capitalists and the, and anyone who makes a profit in the rental housing market. I know you reached out to her office and uh, I think you mm-hmm. were... Several times, yeah. Denied her, her take <laughs> on what down. financialization... She'll talk to the... Uh, and like a week after that, I saw her interviewed by the Globe and Mail. So it's not that she was completely unreachable. It was just she didn't feel like having to explain herself to me, I guess. The same, and I might add her that the the academic who seems to have done most of the work for her Martine August at the University of Waterloo she also refused several requests from me for an interview so they've got lots to say but they don't want to say it to me well i think that's a good understanding for the listeners of what financialization kind of means and how they're kind of blaming the current crisis on financialization i mean in your opinion what do you believe is the root cause of the rental housing crisis in canada right now and How does it differ from this office's understanding of the issue? Well, I think what's most interesting is you look at how does the federal housing advocate think that we can solve a current housing crisis, which, as you said, is is really a a lack of supply. And you go through the recommendations made in these, these reports, and they are all, from my perspective, these are measures that will reduce supply. This is things like regulating banks to prevent them from loaning money to firms that 
build housing for profit, prohibiting pension funds from doing the same thing, denying for profit rental housing companies access to federal federal programs, imposition of nationwide rent control, a whole variety of uh, expropriation of certain housing owned by the for-profit sector. Really, it's a whole raft of measures meant to make it impossible for owners to make a profit, to raise rents. And all of that is what gives people inclination to build more. It's the prospect of profit that leads companies and individuals to draw up plans to add to supply in this country. And and all the recommendations are aimed at preventing the for-profit private sector from having any inclination to build. What, what they see as the, their mandate is to improve social co-op nonprofit housing. That's the perspective that the federal housing advocate seems to have as the solution to Canada's housing crisis. I think it's worth mentioning that all of that comprises about 4% of Canada's total housing stock. Uh, In terms of rental housing, it's about 11%. So they figure that this tiny sliver of existing supply is going to be able to deliver on... The federal government says we need 3.5 million new homes by 2031. The Ontario government says they want to build a million homes in the next 10 years. Large scale, this is more than we've, this is a doubling of, would require a doubling of housing starts. And these financialization folks think it can all be done by co ops, nonprofits, and, you know, sort of municipal affordable housing efforts. So, so I think that's completely out to lunch. This, they have no conception of, of where supply actually comes from. This is an entirely political, ideologically driven effort. They think profit is bad, therefore, eliminating profit will yield some great benefit. That's where that sits. In in terms of my solution, it would be everything that the federal housing advocate says do the opposite of. I think that would probably, and and that's what we're seeing in Ontario, for instance, you know, it's quite clear that it's municipal regulations and various red tape and all those sorts of problems that is getting in the way of adding new housing. And so if we, if we're really committed to building a lot more houses and certainly It seems like the Ontario government, for instance, is those are the kind of policies you're going to need. Yeah, if we any of these recommendations went through, it essentially eliminate the private sector from participating in the rental housing market. It would be an end to anything, to any new building. Why would what would be the motivation for any any private sector operator to if they're told that any profit they make is illegitimate? Any attempt at raising rents, regardless of the situation, impinges on people's human rights and therefore is immoral. There's just no motivation to do anything. And and maybe I'll I'll step back a bit. The federal housing advocate and her cadre of like-minded academics, they make this case that it's unprecedented. What we're seeing now, this financialization, they look out the window, they see REITs and publicly traded uh, companies getting into the rental housing market. Their predisposition is to say that anyone who makes a profit is somehow evil or immoral. And they've declared that, you know, this is so the world is going to hell in a handbasket and that this is unprecedented. In fact, the periods of time in Canada in which we have seen the greatest amount of new housing, new rental housing construction, which is really what a lot of people want to, to solve the housing crisis, was the, the early 70s. And that, that was a time when you saw, using their definition, you saw an incredible amount of financialization in the housing market. It wasn't the same as it is now. It wasn't REITs and, and publicly traded companies. Back then, it was insurance companies and syndicates of lawyers and doctors who would get together, pool their funds, and they would either buy an existing apartment building or they would get a fund together to to build an apartment building. And we saw an incredible amount of, of construction in the early late 60s, early 70s, based on that form of financialization. What happened was rent control in the mid-70s and tax law changes at the federal level that put an end to all that. And so, so in the early 70s, we we're seeing 100,000 units a year on average being built. And for a, a Canada the size of whatever Canada was in the early 70s, Right now, with this, all this, you know, every government is four square behind more, more supply, et cetera. And given Canada's so much larger population basis, we're seeing like, like 60,000 purpose-built rentals constructed. So we're not even at the level 
we were in the 70s, regardless of the fact that the population is so much bigger. We still haven't returned to that, even with all this evil financialization. So it's historically inaccurate also to say that this financialization is unprecedented. The fact of the matter is, if you look to the, the times when Canada was able to address housing supply in a really, really major way, it was financialized, and I'm using air quotes here, but your listeners can't see, financialized firms who were intent on making a profit and saw an opportunity and the tax and financial structure was such that it was is worth their while to do so. And that's that's when you saw an enormous amount of capital going into purpose-built rental. And we're trying to get back there now, but you've got these other folks who are trying to make it as difficult as possible. Yeah, and I think you have a lot of people doing your claims as well. John <laughs> Dickey, president of the CFA, is quoting mm-hmm. an article, you know, saying what we are seeing is a demonization of financialized landlords. And uh, you mentioned evil, and I think that's uh, an accurate statement. Now, you mentioned REITs. Switch it up a little bit. You mentioned in your article, you reference Andre Pavlov, Mm -hmm. a finance professor at Simon Fraser University, and you reference his experiences with government housing. Essentially, what the office is proposing is, like you mentioned, abolishing privately built rentals and putting the onus on the government to create not only just affordable housing, but to meet all of the housing targets that are set out by 2030. Mm-hmm. So can you walk us through a little bit about Andrei, Andrei Plavlov, his experience back home in this country of Bulgaria, and really why his experience mirrors what is being proposed, and essentially why social housing isn't a solution for us? Sure. That, that's the example I lead off the story with. And it was just one of those examples of sort of a wonderful uh, coincidence that happens when you do research. And Andre Pavlov is an expert in housing finance. As he said, he's a finance prof at Simon Fraser University. But he also happened to, to grow up in Bulgaria under the communist rule, which I didn't know when I reached out to him. But as we were talking, he you know, said, well, let me tell you about my background. And so, so yeah, he, he grew up in, in Bulgaria behind the Iron Curtain. And he was telling me about you know the housing that was everywhere. And I I think your listeners probably have a general mental impression of this communist era housing. It's these large, imposing, concrete, sort of bunker-like buildings. And it turns out there's this interesting backstory. They're, they're all made with prefabricated concrete panels that can be sort of craned into place. Uh, Khrushchev decided this was the cheapest and most efficient way to, to house everybody in, in, in communist Russia and, and Eastern Europe, and they all had different, they were all, the names they were given in Bulgaria, they were called uh, Penelkis, in East Germany, they were called Panelhaus, they had, a, there was another similar name in Hungary, so they're all these prefabricated concrete panel houses, and they were all terrible, as, as Pavlov explained to me. The build quality was terrible, these are made off-site, these panels are just craned into place, no one really cared about doing a good job because there was no profit to be made. There was no competition. Either you lived here or you lived in a hut, basically. They leaked because the panels weren't joined properly. They were dark. They were small because the government just wanted to house everybody as quickly and cheaply as possible. Really depressing places to live. And this, as, as Pavlov said, you know, this is he read through the Federal Housing Advocates report, and he says, well, this is what they're this is what they're recommending is state provided uh, housing if you if you take the profit completely out of everything and you declare housing to be a human right that must be government provided then this is what you're going to get and perhaps even the worst part of these panelkis is that because it was all controlled through the communist party they weren't even fairly distributed despite the fact that they're all crappy places to live in the, the best ones you know the penthouses or the ones that maybe had fewer leaks or whatever are the bigger footprint. They were all given to party officials and their friends and family. You know, they're all distributed on a crony, corrupt sort of basis. So it's not just a sort of a, a theoretical issue here. I and mean, here's someone, an expert in the field who can tell you, well, this is what you get if you go down this road. If you declare housing to be a human right that must be government provided without any profit, these are the implications. This is what you're going to get. And I can guarantee you, no one in Canada wants to live in a Penelope. So that's that's the that's the consequences of taking this, you know, as I say, a, sort of a Marxist perspective on things. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss an episode by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you.
thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Yeah, something that's been brought up numerous times throughout is that REITs and other larger private organizations are driving up rents mm-hmm. when they, you know, when have they vac- when they have vacant units and do renovations and improve the quality of their units. It naturally drives up rents and doesn't sound great to their, their current tenants, but at the end of the day, you're creating a, a better place to live. So, you know, can you take us through a little bit why REITs and other private investors, you know, actually offer better housing options than some of the smaller and smaller mom and pop run operations? One of the unusual aspects of this whole federal housing advocates research agenda on financialization is this animosity towards REITs, especially in any form of sort of corporate housing ownership compared to this mom and pop. And they there's this sort of a theme that runs through it that it would be better if it was run by small landlords. They, they assume that small landlords are somehow less likely to renovate or less likely to raise rents. They're somehow going to be nicer to their tenants. There's no, absolutely no evidence of, of this. Someone who gets into, someone who owns an apartment and rents it out is is likely motivated by making profit. And I don't see that there's any reason. And they again, they, they provide no evidence to say that some individual independent landlord is less likely to raise rents, less likely to renovate and ask the tenants to leave. None of that. So it's completely unscientific in that way. And if you talk to industry folks, they'll say that there's, there's substantial benefits to having corporate ownership in terms of regular routines and and systems in place that take the human element out. In other places, this federal housing advocate campaign claims that financialization is racist and that it hurts black and racialized tenants in some unspoken way. Again, no evidence for this. And it would seem to me on a prima facie basis that if you have a sort of a computerized system for accepting tenants, it's going to be less racist than it would be if if someone is meeting people at the front door and deciding, do I like the look of that possible tenant over this possible tenant? So that that's a, a really problematic and, and quite sketchy part of this argument. The other thing that they're much more explicit about is that REITs in particular are responsible for driving up rents, as you say, either through renovation and, and then re-renting out at a higher rate, or simply as because they've some sort of market power, that they've cornered the market, REITs are, are growing in power, and then they now have the ability to raise rents because of a concentration. And that you can easily disprove. REITs, I think, comprise about 10% of Canada's rental housing market, so not a very concentrated industry. The standard measure for concentration is the amount of the amount of the market that's comprised of the top five competitors in any industry. I, I go through that in the story. I think it's about 87% for Canadian banks, like the, the top five Canadian banks control about 87% of the market. For uh, telecoms, it's about 83% of the market is controlled by the five largest telecoms. In the rental housing industry, the top five corporate landlords control about 5% of the industry. So there's it, it fails on on pure math. Corporate owners do not have market power. It's not a very concentrated, it's a very diffuse market. So so we can dispense with that as well. And then the, the last part that you raised was what, what people now call renovictions, which has become a, a real pejorative and politicians everywhere seem convinced that it's a real problem. This used this is what used to be called updating the housing supply. This used to be considered a fairly good thing is if a owner decided to improve their property, uh, fix it up, add the newer put in newer appliances or repair the you know, replace the windows, you know, whatever goes on with a a full-scale renovation. In the old days, before we came worried about financialization, anyone who fixed up their rental property would be considered doing a great service to the country. No one wants their national housing stock to get run down. It needs to be constantly, anyone who's owned a house knows you need to constantly be improving things. Some of those renovations are bigger and more time consuming than others. So certainly sometimes tenants have to be removed. Sometimes they get priced out of their old apartment by the renovations. But that again, that's the market talking. And there's all sorts of good evidence about sort of the, the flow through of rental housing as you add at the top end. Rental units at the bottom end become available as people move up and down. I mean, that's a natural 
course of action. These Marxists that are convinced that financialization is an evil have reframed the entire debate around whether the housing stock should be refreshed or not into it being a bad thing. Presumably, they think uh, nothing should be improved. And if that's the case, well, then you're certainly welcome to move into public housing because that's the great disadvantage of public housing is that they're chronically underfunded in terms of renovations. And we've seen that, I don't know if I can find the figure, but Toronto Community Housing, which is the second largest landlord in the country, their backlog of renovations, oh yeah, here it is, it's like $1.5 billion, enormous. As I go in the story, there's the Swansea Muse in, in Toronto, owned by Toronto Community Housing. The roofs were fall, the roof fell in on one unit and they had a evict everybody because they were a danger to people to the tenants health so if you if you think that not renovating is the solution to canada's housing problem if you think that your human right is is improved by not having the landlord fix things in your unit then public housing is for you because that's the legacy there on the other hand if you'd like to live in a place that's been modernized and fixed up and, and owned by a landlord that actually cares about the state of their units and is concerned enough to spend their own money to make sure they're top of the line or whatever, then the private sector is, is the option. And I think most Canadians would, would agree they'd rather live in a place owned by a landlord that, that cares enough to spend their own money to fix things up. Yeah, you mentioned evidence. Evidence is a key word throughout this whole discussion. We have evidence that financialization does work, and we have evidence that social housing does not work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying social housing is terrible, and there's some fine co-ops out there, and for a certain segment of of the rental population, social housing may be the best and only option. So I'm certainly, I'm not sort of the equivalent of of. Ool on the other side saying we shouldn't have any social housing. I think there's a, f- a place for it, certainly, but it's certainly not the universal solution. You know, other examples, that Grenfell Tower fire in, in London a couple of years ago where 72 people died. Again, that was publicly owned housing. The, you know, New York City's public housing is, is terrible. So there, there was no electricity. There was no hot water for long stretches of time in recent years. So there's a big, big problems. And to say that we can get rid of all uh, profit-making landlords and, and simply rely on social housing co-ops and, and other affordable housing efforts to, to solve all our problems is just, is just absolutely delusional. It will never hit the target set out Ottawa if we rely solely on social housing with the, the massive immigration numbers we're expecting. Absolutely it's, impossible, yeah. It's evident we have to work hand in hand between the private sector and the social sector. I mean, in your opinion, really, what role should the government play in addressing the current rental housing crisis? Well, I think we've seen a lot of encouraging signs, particularly in Ontario, in terms of requiring municipalities to re- relax all their regulations. J- just the focus on supply, I think it's slowly coming around that for a long time, people denied even that we had a supply problem. And so the, the, the acceptance even from the federal government, you know, this is how many million houses we need to build from the provinces. This is how many million houses we have to build. People are starting to focus on supply as the issue. And I think that's that's good. You know, that there will always be a segment of society that may not be able to afford market level rents is the solution to set up a whole bunch of co-ops. I think that's really problematic, especially given co-ops tend to be volunteer driven. If you want supply fast, the private sector is always the group that's going to be able to deliver because that's simply what they do. Capital is what they do. In terms of affordability, I think the Canada Housing Benefit, which is a, a, a new innovation from the, the federal liberals, is, is the way to go. It's essentially a, a bump up or a, a cash payment that allows people with affordability problems to access privately owned housing, but you know gives them a subsidy so that they can have their pick among for-profit apartments, et cetera, rather than having to rely on public housing or social housing to, to find something that they can afford. The problem, as I discussed in the story, is that these sorts of cash payments, unless there is sufficient supply, these sorts of cash payments simply get built right into rents. So, you know, if there's if you're constrained in terms of supply, if it's a seller's market, giving people a benefit 
a cash benefit is going to get sucked away very quickly. So we still need even I, I think that's a good long term solution is a, is a housing benefit because it allows the private sector to deliver on housing. And that's clearly the, the segment that is best able to move fast and, and to move in large numbers. Ultimately, though, I, I think a housing benefit is, is once we get the supply problem solved, then I think a housing benefit makes more sense to me than really, really leaning on the co-op and, and nonprofit segments. Because as we've seen in the past, again, going back to the 70s, et cetera, government interest in that kind of thing really wanes and fluxes. There was a period in the 70s and 80s when, when governments were really keen on this kind of thing. And then you hit an austerity era and governments really pull back. And so you've got this push and pull effect on on co-op and social housing funding. And, and you don't get that with the, the private sector. Now, Peter covered a lot there. You know, definitely, I think there, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel of this. It ultimately, it comes back to supply. <laughs> Do you really see any other countries out there that kind of compare to Canada's current mm-hmm. rental crisis? And have you seen any solutions that other countries have maybe implemented that could possibly work here as well? Well, I haven't looked at it for a little while, but I know in Ontario in particular, there was the called the as of right revolution or innovation in which you give people the right to build something new on their properties without having to go through a whole bunch of municipal hoops. In Ontario, we got kind of a watered down version of it with the Ford government. It's been talked about in Vancouver. New Zealand made uh, quite a few headlines a year or two ago by declaring as of right across the entire country, which would mean that a homeowner could uh, tear down their house and put up a duplex or a fourplex without having to spend years um, getting applications in order and stuff. That, that The fact is that the owner of the property essentially has the right within certain bounds to change the housing on their property and essentially add a whole bunch more if it makes sense for them. So that that kind of we're also seeing that on a municipal level in the and and a state level in the US a little bit, just the beginnings of this, which is it's really good news from my perspective because it's saying that private landowners are really the solution here. That if if I decided I wanted to put a granny suite in the backyard or I wanted to put a separate unit in my basement or I wanted to tear the whole thing down and put up a duplex or a fourplex or something that I'm I don't face any any serious regulatory hurdles for doing that. I mean that has the potential of really increasing housing supply. So that's on a kind of on a micro level. Certainly the the trends we've seen in Canada with big corporate interest coming back to the rental housing market after being away for decades is is also good. I can't tell you whether that has any parallels in other countries or not because I haven't really looked at it too carefully but but anything that gets private capital interested in building housing is is good from my perspective i think that's a good positive way to start wrapping this up a little bit Mm -hmm. now this is going to be like you said we're kind of at the precipice of some of these advocates proposals where would you suggest people keep an eye on what's going on in ottawa and is there anywhere that they can kind of voice their concerns with what is being proposed funny you should mention it just in prepping for our our talk here i had a look at what was going on at the federal housing advocate and the national housing council because i haven't you know really spent much time on it since the story came out and then turns out last week this national housing council has accepted ool's request for a uh, inquiry into financialization so they're just just last week a, a call went up on their website saying that interested parties can appear and and make a discussion so these the the machinery of ottawa is grinding along i would also note that that this a study of financialization which with the, the the pejorative meaning front and center is also included in the supply and confidence agreement between the federal nds and and liberals so and and you can see signs of it also in the federal budget and and various places so it's not just it's not just the federal housing advocate these these notions are permeating through a lot of the levers of government, and it's we're starting to see the outward and visible signs of this. The the National Housing Council's hearings is 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 one example of this. So I found when I was doing my research that it was some industry folks were very reluctant to go on the record with this. They were kind of hoping, I think, that it would all kind of blow over, or if they didn't say anything nasty that they would sort of get a, a good hearing in Ottawa. You mentioned John Dickey. He was one of the few 
people that was prepared to to say what he believed in it, and it was a very refreshing interview with him. But there's there's some aspects of this industry seem to think that they can stay quiet and and fix it behind the scenes, and I'm not convinced on that really. And and here we've got this this series of hearings that is just going to be a I would expect it to be a nonstop forum for complaints about capitalism and REITs and profit and how people's human rights are being denied by financialization. So it's all out there. And I think the industry as a whole and individually, different companies need to start speaking out about it because if you don't, uh, it becomes a sort of accepted wisdom. Yep. So for any listeners out there, make sure, like Peter says, keep an eye on some of these hearings. Definitely not going to blow over anytime soon. Peter, as we wrap up here, thank you so much for shedding some light on this topic and letting the listeners know a little bit what's going on in Ottawa behind the scenes. Where can they follow you and where can they read their article and where's a good resource to stay on top of this topic? Well, I'll just repeat the C2C Journal's website to www.c, the letter C2, the number two, letter C, journal.ca. That's where most of my work appears. We do have deals with the National Post and some other publications where we give them shorter versions of our our stories to just spread the, the word a little bit. Uh, Financial Post comment is a, a favorite place for those shorter versions of my essays. But anyway, no, it's it's an interesting topic and I'm sure I'll be coming back to it because it's, it's certainly there's more to chew on, as you said. All right, so everyone, yeah, check out C2G Journal. Keep an eye on Peter's work. He's doing some great jobs on highlighting some of these industry trends and I think that's a good place to end. Peter, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me, Matt. No problem. All right. Have a good day, everyone. You've reached the end of another episode of Sink or Swim. Make sure to visit us at rensink.com forward slash podcast to access show notes, key takeaways, and where you can sign up to our newsletter to receive free bonus content. If you found value in the show, please also remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Thanks for listening.